Hi everyone and welcome to Business Minds. I'm Cindy Bird, business owner, educator, and thinking partner with a passion for helping people and businesses thrive. I'm so thankful that you chose to join the program today and look forward to sharing some hopefully valuable information with you as we always do here on Business Minds. Whether you're a business owner, an aspiring entrepreneur, or just someone in general who wants to make a difference in the workplace, in the business world, make it a, a better place each day. We're here to help you with learning and collaboration, to connect you to resources to other business owners and people out in the business world in general for some thought-provoking learning and collaboration. This month's theme, if you've been watching before, has been what I wish I'd known then, where I've been asking my guests to answer the question, what do you know now that you wished you'd known when you started in business? And a couple of weeks ago, Chris Heine was my guest, and last week, Julie Drake was my guest. They both did such a fantastic job of sharing some really excellent learning points that they have uh, that have benefited them over the years of being in business. It's great to hear from those seasoned entrepreneurs. And as I reflected back over what Chris and Julie shared, it got me to thinking, how would I answer that question? What do I know now that I wish I'd known when I started in business? And actually, when I thought about it, it took me back farther, not just when I started my business, but when I started in the working world in general as an employee. What do I know now that I wish I'd known back then? And there are a lot of things I could share with you, but this would be a three hour webcast instead of 29 minutes. And uh, I'm sure that would be a little boring after a point. So I decided to narrow it down to three things that I want to share with you today. And I think you'll see that there are some common threads across all three. The first thing I know now that I wish I'd known then, what I've learned is to strive for work-life harmony rather than balance. I don't know about you, but when I picture the word balance, it, I see a scale in my head, the old fashioned scale where everything has to be equal if it's going to be in balance, right? And that's not realistic. There are always going to be times in our life when maybe work requires more of our attention or something in life requires more of our attention. And if we constantly think they have to be equal and in balance, we're setting ourselves up for a lot of unnecessary stress and strife and, and even resentment, resenting that something in your work is pulling you away from something in life in general and vice versa. So uh, what I've learned is that harmony means I can integrate all of the parts of my life, not just in the general mind, body, spirit sense, that's important of course, but whatever those parts are in your life, they're gonna be different than what mine is. And certainly those parts of my life that I've wanted to work in harmony and, and integrate over the years have changed and evolved. Uh, having younger children is certainly different than having older children and now grandkids as I do. Being an employee versus being a business owner, you know, so life evolves and changes. But what has helped me achieve that harmony is to be honest with myself and stand up and say, I'm a procrastinator. Yes, I am. But the greatest learning from that, though, has been why do I procrastinate? So digging a little bit deeper. That, and I've also used some great information from a couple of sources that I'm sure you're familiar with as well that has helped me to understand that if I'm going to have this work-life harmony and effectively integrate everything that I have a passion for and want to do in my life that I've got to prioritize prioritizing and put that at the top of my list often. David Rock explains that very well in his book, Your Brain at Work. And of course, 
Stephen Covey in his very uh, well-known book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks about that we should spend more time in the quadrant of important but not urgent. And so I have to remind myself of that and be intentional about striving for that work-life harmony and integration versus balance. And I have to purposely set aside time for reflection and critical thinking. I used to teach a time management workshop and one of the things that I would have people do towards the end of the workshop when I talked about this importance of reflective time and critical thinking time, I'd say, okay, everybody uh, get your planners out. For some people back in the day, that was a hard copy planner. For others, it was a Blackberry, a PDA of some kind. Regardless, I would say, oh, do you have anywhere in your week where you've got an hour blocked out that says reflect, think? And of course, they would all kind of chuckle and laugh at the absurdity of that and say, well, no, of course I don't do that. But that's what has helped me, is to intentionally block out that time. And if you're doing that out there now, great. You've probably been benefiting from it as well. And the other thing that helps me strive for work-life harmony and integration is that I have to be the one who takes responsibility for choosing how I spend my time. Um, I can't blame my procrastination or my poor choices of how I'm spending my time on someone else. Um, I have to take that personal responsibility. There was a woman who was in one of my time management workshops uh, early on when I was teaching it. And I always go around the room at the beginning and ask, so why are you here? What do you hope you're going to learn today ab about time management that you can readily apply in your life? And she was very quick to tell me, oh, I'm not here for me. I'm here because I've got all these other people in my life who are screwing up my ability to manage my time. And, and it is humorous, but we often think that way, that it's somebody else who's causing us to not be able to have this great work-life harmony instead of taking personal responsibility. And as you've all heard, I'm sure, you are the only one who is in charge of your behavior, your choices and decisions and actions. As much as we wish we could control other people, uh, that's a myth. Which takes me to my next thing that I've learned, and that is that with God's grace, I am the director of my life. I'm the one responsible for my happiness and my personal well-being. And I actually had that pointed out to me at a pretty young age. When I was nine years old and a patient in Forest Park Rehabilitation Center at St. Francis Hospital, now OSF. I was there because I was totally paralyzed by a disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Nearly died a couple of times because I had double pneumonia going into this whole ordeal and uh, they struggled to keep me breathing at times. But I got to a point where I was well enough to start some physical therapy, and I was very fortunate to have a roommate at the time. Her name was Penny. Penny was 15, and from Rockford, Penny was in a long recuperation process because she'd been hit by a car while riding her bicycle. Her pelvis had been broken in multiple places, and she had a lot of other injuries as well. And I was in the therapy room, and one of the first things they do when you're recuperating from a full paralysis like mine is they put you on a device called the tilt table. And it sounds counterintuitive that a paralyzed person feels pain, but when your body is either bent or you're, they try to sit you up or put you in an upright position, it shoots excruciating pain down the back of your legs. So the tilt table is designed to get you used to being in that upright position just a little at a time. Well, I was struggling with even a little at a time. And I'm nine, I'm crying. I'm saying, I want my mom, I want my dad, I just wanna go home, I just want this to be over with. Penny wheeled over to me in her wheelchair and she said, Cindy, you're the only one who can do this. You have to do this. Take responsibility. You can do this. So it was part encouragement, 
part really great advice coming from a 15-year-old. And I can't say that I, well, I should tell you, the next morning when I went in, I raised my hand, kind of like, you know, hey, coach, I'm ready, put me into play. I looked at my physical therapist and I said, put me up all the way. Of course, he looked at me like, are you sure? And I said, yes. I won't lie and tell you it didn't hurt like the Dickens. It did. But it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. I realized I was in control. I had a choice. I could take charge, be the director of my life. And I had to. It was the start of my road to recuperation. And I'd like to say I've always followed Penny's advice, um, but that hasn't always been the case, especially when life threw me some pretty unexpected and devastating curveballs. And I allowed my energy, my focus to go off in the direction of being the victim. And and not empowering myself, not believing in myself, not putting the energy back into being the director of my life. And I lost who I was for about three years. God and Penny's words and some other very close people around me reminded me, though, that I'm the director and I had the power to choose to not be the victim to choose to move forward. It was like being reborn. I was reborn. I realized who I really was. I rediscovered my authentic self, my business, everything about what I was doing went in a new direction. And I was much more focused. I became uh, able to pursue what I'm really passionate about and, and get back to that work-life harmony and integrating all the parts of my life that I talked about. I had a lot of help to do that. And more recently, the fields of positive psychology, neuroscience, mindfulness practice, um, all of those things have opened my eyes to how we have so much power within us to be able to be the directors of our lives and, and how we have a relationship with our thoughts. I wish I had known all of that a long time ago, and things might have taken a lot of different turns. I've got enhanced health and well-being. Uh, it's got me greater focus and mental clarity. I'm able to do the things that I want to do in life with no regrets. And I'd like to say no worries, too. I'm still working on that one. But it's greatly improved my ability to be more calm and resilient in the face of challenges that have come my way since I started practicing mindfulness meditation and learning a lot more about neuroscience as well. Which leads me to my third item. And that is I've learned there's learning and inspiration in everyone and everything that we encounter in life. It could be that 15-year-old penny like I had. It can be a parent, uh, your son or daughter, your spouse. It's in everything and everyone. Uh, you might find inspiration in uh, a bumper sticker, in song lyrics, you know, like do wa diddy diddy dum. No, I'm just kidding. I don't find any inspiration in those lyrics. But I love always stay humble and kind. That's Tim McGraw for you non-country fans out there. But my point is, if we want to tap into the power of that learning and inspiration that is in everyone and everything we encounter in life, I've also learned that it takes these things. It takes being open to it, of course, but it also takes living in the moment, not dwelling in the past, not focused on what's happening that hasn't even happened yet and worrying about that, but living in the moment, picking up on those cues and inspiration that is everywhere around us in, if we, while we're interacting with people, while we're going about our day. It doesn't have to come from formal means. There's a lot of informal learning opportunities out there. 
I've learned. And I've been a formal educator for a big part of my life. I know it comes from that too, but it also comes in so many ways. So being open to it, living in the moment, really present, really noticing, really conscious of what's going on around you. And also being intentional about seeking feedback. One of the greatest places and, and means that I've gained a lot of learning and insight from is when I've sought feedback about myself. That's not always easy to do, and some people, you're either open to it or, or maybe um, you don't think you need it, you're maybe walking through life a little delusional, unfortunately, but seeking it intentionally is what I've learned is the key. And then after I tell you a quick story why that's so important to me, I'll talk about what do you do with that feedback afterwards. So my big aha learning moment came in 2004 when I became a full-time business professor at Robert Morris University. I'd already been teaching there part-time a couple of years prior to that while I was still working full-time at Illinois Central College and starting Image Potential. But um, I was very fortunate to be offered the position of a full-time business professor. So started fall quarter 2004, intro to business class. So excited to be in my first class with my students, even though I taught some evening classes. This just was different. And go around the room the first day, you know what that's like. The instructor's talking about expectations and how the class is laid out. I'm showing them my Blackboard site online, talking about the syllabus, all of the usual things. And at the end, I turned to the students, of course, and I asked if there were any questions. And this woman in the back row, her hand shot up right away. She was about 30, 31, and I'd learned through introductions at the beginning of class that this was her first college class. She'd never gone to college before. And I remember when she introduced herself, I felt an instant connection to her because that's how old I was when I started college and whittled away at my degrees over the course of, of 18 years, going part-time and, and uh, working sometimes two and three jobs at the same time and starting my business. Hmm, maybe that's why I had to get so good at work-life harmony and integration. Anyway, I, I felt a connection to her right away. And I was pleased that she had a question for me. And I said, yes, what's your question? And she said, do you give pop quizzes? And boy, I was really thrown by that question. It just wasn't something I was expecting her to ask of me. And I had to think really fast on my feet for a moment. And I thought, well, I've ne I didn't ever give a pop quiz when I was teaching part-time. But hey, I'm a full-time business professor. Now I might want to give a pop quiz every now and then. But I didn't want to tell her that I do give pop quizzes and then end up not giving one because that would be dishonest. And I couldn't tell her the opposite either because that also would be dishonest. So I said something like this. I said, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not in the habit of giving pop quizzes. I think there's a better way that we can spend our time together in the classroom. I think there's a better way that I can assess your learning. But I'm curious to know, why did you ask that question? And she said, because you seem sneaky. Okay, I can hear you gasping all the way out there. Truly, I can. This is a true story. That's exactly what she said to me. I couldn't wait to go to the ladies' room after class, look in the mirror. You know, what was it about me that had caused her to perceive me as sneaky? Well, here's the big mistake I made. I never asked her. I passed it off as her problem. Oh, I must just remind her of someone that she had as a teacher in the past who gave her a pop quiz and it had a poor outcome. Oh, she's just nervous and anxious because she's 30 and it's her first college class. Shame on me for not being more empathetic with her because that was me uh, in the past as well. But I never asked her. Fast forward a couple months, I noticed students weren't coming to me with questions either before or after class. They weren't coming to me during office hours. Or if they did, they acted like... Um, you know, I, they were interrupting me, disturbing me. So I took a colleague of mine aside and I said, Joe, I said, I'm fun, I'm approachable. 
I don't understand why this is happening. He said, can we talk? I said, absolutely, because this is not how I want things to be. I'm here to help my students, and if they're not coming to me, I can't help them. He said, well, let's start with how you're dressed. He said, you look like a big barrier. I had the proverbial black business suit on with a black and white top that was more black than white. Okay, I'm still wearing black and white today, but hey, it's a little more fun. It's more white. It's a little frilly jacket. Okay, you get the idea. The softer side of Cindy. He said, well, that, that was an easy fix. What was more challenging for me was when he opened my eyes to the fact that he said, did you ever realize that your students might find you intimidating? You're a smart lady. You know a lot about a lot of subjects. And they're, they're just learning. He says, you got to change up the way you say things in the classroom, your body language even. He said, let's talk about what the expression is on your face when they show up in your door. That feedback was so powerful to me. It not only helped me to better connect with my students, to realize I wasn't being true to myself, the fun, approachable person that I really am and I wanted them to realize and experience, but it spilled over into the other parts of my life as well. That was powerful feedback. So I want to tell you that, of course, the key is to be open to that feedback, of course, but then to take it and learn from it and to move forward and act with mindful intention. When you notice yourself falling back into those things that maybe are what I call fatal distractions. They're keeping you from really connecting to people, from building a relationship with people like you want to. Moving forward, I even had a student come to me and say, I don't know, I think you're a little too accessible, which I found funny. You know, ac accessible, approachable, those are really two different things. But it's something that caused me to further expand the work that I do when I uh, coach people on their personal brand with how to really be authentic and really do the best job possible of being who they really are, being their authentic selves in every part of their life, not just one part of their life. Really important thing to do. So those are my three uh, top things that I know now that I wish I'd known back then to strive for work-life harmony versus work-life balance to, and in keeping with that, to make sure that I'm honest about myself with why I'm procrastinating, to prioritize prioritizing, make sure I'm setting aside time for reflection and critical thinking, and that I'm not blaming someone else. I'm taking personal responsibility for my choices of how I'm choosing to spend my life and my work and my time, of course. The second learning point that I shared with you is that with, with God, I am the director of my life. I am the one who's responsible for my decisions, my choices, my actions, and how I choose to live my purpose, how I choose to interact and show up in this world. I had some great people along the way that helped me to realize that, including my good friend and past roommate, Penny. And more recently, learning from the fields of mindfulness, neuroscience, social and emotional intelligence, I forgot to mention that one. All of that has just been so beneficial for me. I can't say enough about that. And, and lastly, I've learned that learning and inspiration is in everything and everyone that we encounter in life. And I think really the most important piece from that was how, how important it is to be purposeful and intentional in seeking feedback and then learning from that feedback and acting mindfully on that feedback moving forward. So speaking of feedback, <laughs> Business Minds is going into its fifth month of programming. Hard to believe that how that time has been uh, passing very quickly, and I've enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, and I hope that what learning and collaboration and, and introspective, thought-provoking material 
I've brought, that Melissa and I brought when she was my co-host in the past, has been relevant and beneficial to you as well. But I don't want to presume that that's the case. I don't want to be delusional that business minds is something that you're finding relevant. So I really, I know every, every week I ask for your feedback. I ask for comments on our Facebook page. Uh, you can comment on the Peoria Life Facebook post of Business Minds. I post the show on my LinkedIn profile. You can reach me at businessminds at email.com. I say that every week that I'm looking for your feedback, but I'm sincerely and earnestly asking for your feedback so that I am making this a program that is the best it can be for what learning and collaboration needs you have in your life, no matter what your role in the business world, uh, whether you are that employee who wants to just make the workplace and the, the working world a better place every day, whether you're a business owner, whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur. I have a few things that I've tossed around as some potential ideas that maybe could be a monthly feature on Business Minds, um, perhaps a guest expert who would always be on once a month. If so, I'd like to know where is the biggest pain point for you out there? What guest expert, what field of, of specialty would you like to hear from on a consistent basis? The other thoughts that I've had that I'd love your feedback on are, would you like business book reviews? If you don't have time to read the book, I could give you maybe a Cliff Notes version of whether or not that business book is something worth investing your time in. Uh, also, perhaps a feature called Brain Insights. I've talked a lot about neuroscience. Would you like a feature that consistently brings in some information there? What about something like the Mindfulness Minute? Also tossing around the idea of devoting the month of May to the growing pains of startup businesses. So please think about those specifics that I'm sharing. Let me know, would you like any of those things? Uh, I can put a Facebook poll out there and have you vote. That would be a great thing to do as well. Um, most important, I want to make this a program for you, the viewers, something that you're benefiting from and getting the most out of with learning and collaboration. Also, uh, because I do want to devote some more time to reflecting over that feedback that you give me in order to plan out the next several months, um, I'll be using next week, May the 1st, as a bye week. And I'll be back on May the 8th with a new program for you. But I also have some exciting news. Uh, I want to use some time next week uh, on May the 1st, especially to prepare for a live interview that I've been invited to do on the world's largest blog talk radio. I'm so excited they've invited me to, to do a live interview at noon central time on May the 2nd, Wednesday, May the 2nd. That'll be um, at www.blogtalkradio slash C-U-T-V news radio. And I'm excited to be preparing for that and having them showcase my business. Uh, really was an honor to have them reach out and expressed interest in doing that. This has been a wonderful opportunity for me to reflect over what I've learned uh, now, what I know now that I wish I'd known when I started my business. So thanks again for tuning in today. Enjoy this beautiful spring weather, and I will see you on May the 8th. Thanks so much. PeoriaLife.com